uh, festival at the you museum, know, I and I went. I'm sorry, she can't. Are you really? You don't like her? I, I love her. I went and saw her on Broadway, but I'm sorry, she can't do Miss Marple <laughs> or Margaret Rutherford. Well, Oprah Sweeney went backstage. You said, "Rare and." We're ready. Poor books. Dean. Do it before the musicians start rehearsing again. Okay, okay, we will. Um, I'm not going to take a whole long time, but I, I hesitate because I know all of these questions are things you've been asked before, but I haven't had the chance to ask. Yeah, them. Well, uh, your career goes back longer than I am aware of. Have lived. <laughs> Thank you, but I doubt that. <laughs> but fill me in. Where, where did it all begin? I, well, I started out as a radio announcer in high school, and I. Well, in 1947, a friend of mine and, and, and myself came to L.A. and started a nightclub act. What did you for do? For a lark. We, it wasn't supposed to be serious. What did you do? At that time, it was very popular to take recordings, and play them backstage, and lip sync, mouth to, yes. record pantomime yes. acts. They were very popular in those days. And uh, we thought it would be fun. We both liked to perform. But we really hadn't any intention of staying in show business. It was just a stopgap thing. But then I got married during that period and started having babies. And, and then television came along, fortunately for me. And I was in local television in Atlanta, Georgia, for about five years. And then I was in local television in New Orleans doing a five-day-a-week show, you know. Talk show? Talk, sing, dance, anything I could think of. Fall down, read the newspaper. And uh, I got an audition at, uh, at CBS in 1955. An old army buddy of mine had become a director at CBS television and got me an, an audition. I flew up there and did my little act. And they put me on a contract, which is how I got to New York in the first place. And then uh, I did the CBS morning show for a year, which was opposite the NBC Today show. And nobody ever saw it. But I did, I did the news and the interviews every day. I was on the air three hours, five days a week. You really schlepped through more of this business than I was aware of. Oh, yeah. I've, I think I've done just about everything except Shakespeare and opera. <laughs> D um, were you ever then in a position of being out of work, hungry, begging? Back in the nightclub days, yes. We had some, some, some real dry periods when we couldn't get work and had to send home to mom and dad, you know. <laughs> uh, you said babies. How many children have you? I have four. And I'm just about to have my fourth grandchild. I have three grandchildren now, and one coming in uh, either August or September. Dick, you d you've done so many things. You made people laugh over the years, and then you turned around and you surprised us. Uh, we weren't laughing. We were feeling an empathy, uh, a sympathy, a gratitude with you. Uh, how does one effectively bridge that gap? Because most comedians, and I think we recognized you as that first, are never allowed to come out of that corner. That's true. That's true for the most part. Although a lot of act of comedians have turned into good dramatic Jackie Gleason, I think of right away in Requiem for a Heavyweight. Mm. Milton Burroughs does some pretty good straight up. And Red Buttons has. But they're very seldom given the, the opportunity to. And it's, like, it's not like playing Hamlet, but I think every performer would like to be able to do something that's out of his line. Singers want to be able to dance, and dancers want to be able to sing. But you've done all of that now, haven't you? So there probably isn't a whole lot you want to do that you haven't. Uh, right now I'm a closet tap dancer. I'm trying to learn to tap dance. <laughs> I'm dying to, and I don't care if it takes forever. I'm going to learn to tap I'll dance. I'll tell you, though, watching you do that routine, you move. My gosh, you're like air. Well, I'm 20 pounds lighter, so it's getting easier all the time. <laughs> I've lost 20 pounds in this, during this show. And you're already, I mean, you were thin to begin uh, with. That's right. It was not exactly a heavyweight to start with. Now, you, traveling all over the country, we're a perfect example right here in the Twin Cities. You can watch yourself uh, grow older, almost. <laughs> You've got reruns all over the country. I know television has that? done that to a lot of people. Yeah. Do you mind that? No, I really don't mind it. It's strange. I thought that I might. But nobody told me when I made the original series, 20 years later, you know, I, there I would still be with dark hair and young. But it doesn't bother me at all. As a matter of fact, I think probably in some strange psychological way, to be able, you know, in old movies too, to be able to see your own growth and to look back that way probably gives one a better overall perspective of their lives than, than 
most people who tend to forget what happened to them 20 years ago. Help me with the name of the movie in which you played Billy Budd. Uh, uh, Billy Bright. Uh, Billy Bright. The comic. Thank you. Yes. The comic. Oh, you're one of the few who saw that. Thank oh, you. you were wonderful in that movie. That, well, you know, Carl Reiner directed it. And it's some of the most fun I ever had making that movie. You were wonderful in that movie. You really were. And, I, and of course, many people talked about the fact that they were certain this was patterned after the life of Stan Laurel because we're told you had some rather strong connection with him. Is all of that true, any of it? Yes, I, I didn't know, know Stanley in his later years, but in, in his retirement. It was patterned after several. Uh, some Stan Laurel, some Buster Keaton. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, gentleman who had a quite short career, I can't remember. Very sad. I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. But it was an amalgamation of what happened to a lot of those silent film comedians. You know, we shot a lot of, of silent footage. Yes. I don't know whether you recall oh, or not yes. of him doing routines. Only about a third of it was ever used in the movie. The other two thirds ended up on the cutting room floor, but things that Carl Ryan and I were really proud of because of the authenticity of what we did. It looked like it had been shot in the 20s. All that was accidentally destroyed, all that footage. I would have given anything to have that just to show my grandkids. And Mickey Rooney played cockeye? That's right, cockeye. Your memory's better than mine. I told you, I like he was Ben Turpin. Yes, yes. Now, Carl Reiner is a name. I mean, you've been associated with a lot of folks along the way who have remained successful as you have. And this is a business that doesn't often lend itself to longevity. To longevity, you're right. It really doesn't. Yes. But Carl Reiner, Mary Tyler Moore. Tell me a little bit about those two. About uh, Mary and Carl? Yeah, I mean, the ki something that we don't know from watching them on television. Oh, I, I can tell you that Carl Reiner is probably one of my favorite people in the world. One of the nicest, warmest, most creative men I've ever met. He's a wonderful human being. I learned a lot from Carl, not just about comedy, but about life. A lot about it. And he's not all that much older than I am either. And if I could explain the relationship we had in a familial way, I would say that Carl Reiner was the uncle and Mary and I were brother and sister. Uh, <laughs> and Rosie and, and Maury were aunts and uncles, too. And one could see the rare chemistry in that show, which is why we're still watching in a reruns today. That kind of thing doesn't thing happen that... professionally often, does it? No, it cannot be planned, written, organized, or created. It has to either happen or not. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it was my first series, and I was spoiled. I thought it was all that easy and all that much fun. It turned out it wasn't. Just the five of us became a, a, an ensemble group. You, uh, at one point, decided you were just kind of going to do something else, and that was move to Arizona. And mm -hmm. f we, we in the did. public thought... I did. I went into semi-retirement and almost went bananas. Did you? <laughs> what made you think that you could retire at all? Why did I you want to? I don't know. I just, it seemed to me that I wanted to get my family out of a large city. We moved out to a beautiful ranch in Arizona, where we still are. And it was wonderful for the kids, you know, it was wonderful for the family. But I didn't realize I was much of an A-type as I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not a very, very aggressive person, but I do have a lot of drive. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a minute, I would be performing even if I wasn't being paid for it. Mm -hmm. So what am I doing? <laughs> and you went crazy. But it's a wonderful time of life for me now because I can kind of do wh what I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry as in the old days about how I'm going to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. So in, for that reason, it's so much more fun for me now. It wasn't long ago that, that the public became aware of a problem you had with alcohol. Mm, and, and you decided that that problem was going to be aired in the hopes that you could help other people. Mm. It took a lot of courage, didn't it? Since then, it's mm. Betty Ford and Billy Carter and so many now. Except, except for the but they weren't doing good. it then. So it no, must have taken courage. I said there were certainly precedents. There were, uh, Mercedes McCainbridge was the first one. And she went before a House uh, committee and talked about it. They were doing a study on it. And I think she kind of broke the dam. And, uh, was all it something those people, you... I think, helped remove the stigma from, the, from that disease. Was it something you considered for a long time before you stepped into the public light with it? Or Yeah, yeah. I, I thought, you know, was it, and it was a good idea or a bad idea, but then, you know... You said, you, and I'd like you to share it with us for the audience, uh, something that was very pleasant when I said that, that I thought the public service spots you did, 
on what to do if you ever caught fire, if there was a fire, were great. Learn not to burn. Yeah. You know, they're that, on yeah. Saturday mornings mostly with children. Yeah. Yeah. But you said that you've often gotten feedback from them. Yes, the fire prevention group that, that produced those uh, keeps track of any, uh, particularly children, who save themselves from a fire by following those rules. And there's about 50 cases of kids in various fire situations who suddenly remembered having seen those Learn Not to Burn commercials and either got low to the floor and crawled out of the house or felt the door. If it was hot, they wouldn't open it. Or if their clothes caught on fire, they knew to roll over and over and over in the grass. And it, and it said so afterwards. I remembered that Dick Van Dyke said that, which is a marvelous feeling. Mm. And it shows what a power television can be when it's used correctly. You seem to be a man who wears your success well. I sense that you're, you're very calm, unlike a lot of celebrities that we share time with. I have a lot of nervous in Well, I'm telling you that this group I'm working with right now is one of the best experiences I've had in 33 years. The cast and the crew and everything, we work together like that. There's not a temperament in the bunch. Mm -hmm. They all give everything, sick or well, every member of this cast, right down to the youngest kids, work hard every performance and give everything they can, which is why our show is doing so well. I've taken too much of your time. They want me to stop. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. People look to Dick Van Dyke. They emulate him. They admire him. Who does Dick Van Dyke look to? Well, as a, as a performer growing up, I always looked to Stan Laurel, who's, ah. to me, one of the greatest of all. I, I couldn't think of any one person that I... That's a pretty nice answer. You're happy now. You're okay. Well, uh, I'm growing, I think. I was happy to find out that you could get middle-aged and, and continue with your growth. Uh. I was raised with the idea that at a certain point in life, you know, you, you stagnated. You just became what you were. It isn't true. I find that you can grow your whole life long, which makes it very exciting. Happy growing. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Thanks very much for the time. My pleasure. They need for you That's to a good interview. Very good. Well, very you're good delightful. Interview. You're just delightful. I start shooting. I don't say a word. Yeah. <laughs> I have oh, to you're listen. Just, you're just listening, so I have to just ramble on and, and tell you about my little two-year-old son. And mm -hmm. You don't have any kids, do you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I have a two-year-old boy. Into all kinds of things, He's talking and walking and learning names and likes to be around other people. Let's see what. It <laughs> Uh, my wife works. How, how long do we have to go on doing this? That's enough. <laughs> okay. How much lateral movement are we going to be allowed? Complete. <laughs>
No boy, bright eyed eagle holds an innocent Sunday school either for me. That kind of gal spins webs that no spider could be listen to. Well, a gal in the trade is all that purity. Barely wants to trade my independence for her security. I'm too late to say the Saturday. 